Today for Primer, we're talking to Mark Stanley. Mark is a Deputy Director at the UK Government Ministry of Justice, leading Probation Digital. I met Mark 10 years ago at the Government Digital Service, and I've been privileged to work with him and learn from him at several departments since then. We had a slogan at the Government Digital Service, Trust Users Delivery. And we talk today about how these three concepts are at the heart of Mark's approach to delivering government services. Here's your primer with Mark Stanley. Welcome to Primer, Mark. It's good to have you here today. Good to be here, thank you. Um, I thought we'd begin by asking you how you came to the UK. Um, you've been here a long time, but you weren't born here, is that right? Yeah, I've been here 40 years now, nearly. Uh, December the 20th, 84, we emigrated. Uh, my dad's job took us around different countries in Africa, so I was in Zimbabwe and Swaziland and South Africa. I still remember coming here on the Greyhound bus to Brighton, the sun had gone down. My dad pointed out the beach and it had stones on it. And the Grand Hotel was laying in the road because the IRA had just tried to um, blow up the Tory party conference. That was a, that was a, that was, that was a real intro to English uh, life and uh, a very, very English town, Brighton. Um, you studied law as an undergraduate, I think, and became yeah. a barrister. Kind of what, what attracted you to the law? I mean, I guess I'd seen different things in different countries which made me interested in systems of rules and how people applied them and why some people didn't and why some people fell foul of them. I was pretty interested in that. So uh, I chose to study law, and then I got really interested in criminal barristering. I think it was the most human thing that I saw. I really wasn't interested in commercial law, but I went to a few courts as part of my training. I saw the Myra Hindley appeal case, and I just saw humanity exposed, and it was really fascinating. I, I mean, barristering, I did that for all of six months. I just couldn't make crime pay. Uh, all of my pals that survived at the bar had uh, dads that bankrolled them and my dad said uh, he couldn't do that. So sadly, I quit that and uh, went into commercial law where I lost my soul, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, before I saw something in government. So you joined Ministry of Justice, I think, in 2010? Yeah, that, that's right. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. They, they had a digital role with a legal background, and I thought, well, I can do the legal background bit and blag the digital bit, and I kind of learned on the job. And what, what sort of things were you doing then? Um, there was a thing called Direct Gov, which was meant to be where government websites, and there were 700 at the time, so people couldn't find a thing. Yeah. Direct Gov was a sort of precursor to Gov.uk, and my job was to help Ministry of Justice content get there. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I was a sort of content production manager. And how, how long were you doing that for? Gosh, I think about a year. But then I heard uh, a guy called Tom Loosemore mm -hmm. uh, advertising and speaking at a thing called AlphaGov, mm -hmm. which sounded really interesting. And it, it was clear it was going to replace this thing called DirectGov. Right, okay. Uh, so it was building not far from here, actually. I came to listen to a talk um, and then I spoke to my boss at the Ministry of Justice and asked if I could climb on the AlphaGov bandwagon on a, on a kind of loan. Okay, so they were, they were looking for people from around government to join, is that the idea? They weren't. I kind of forced my way in. I was okay. really interested in it and <laughs> I think my boss saw it as the future as well, so he was quite keen to sponsor me. Uh, and I, I went over there as a, I don't know, they described me as a sort of minder in a way, I had some content talent working with me and for me. Yeah. And I was the kind of busy, as they put it, or the fuzz that kind of managed their work. Uh, and they allowed me to stay. I just kept staying. So I was, I was there for a couple of years. So MLJ weren't looking to have you back during this? They, they were struggling with me being away that long, but I think they saw that MOJ was forging a good relationship with the government digital service, as was then emerging. Uh, I still remember a really interesting bit where we were converging some content on courts, and the permanent secretary got very excited about this and sent a note through my boss to meet me at uh, GDS. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still remember my boss saying down the phone that I really ought not to convert it, 
a, a volume loud enough for people four banks away to get. So that was probably a hot moment in terms of hands off our stuff. But by and large, I think it set the Ministry of Justice up on a good, a good relationship with you know, what I call the mothership, the GDS. Yeah, yeah. So AlphaGov, it became GDS, is that, is that right? Um, the Government Digital Service kind of almost came afterwards. It's almost a label that came after they decided on the product. So Tom Lusmore was there, um, That's right. Mike Bracken. Yeah, Mike came in uh, a little later. I think he was, he was the, 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 the guy that they saw as a good sort of front person for it, a good uh, CEO, uh, Richard Pope. Um, Jamie Arnold, yeah, uh, and basically it was it was he who kind of taught me that probably my talent was best placed in the sort of delivery management area. So that's where I really started learning a proper digital skill. And we we met, um, I think it was the tail end of two thousand and thirteen, where uh, you, Emily Weber, and Dave Mann, I think, in interviewed me for a, right, some yeah. delivery management work at GDS. Um, and we worked on the service owner training, I think, in the early 2014. Um, I, I remember we were talking about trust at one point, and I remember, I remember saying, well, trust has to be earned. And you, in your kind of uh, very typical way, said, I'm just going to stop you there, Mark. Trust can be given. Um, and that had quite a profound effect on me uh, since, really. Have you got any, any thoughts about that? Like why should trust be given or what does it mean to give trust? I mean, I guess I'm interested in the effect it had on you as well, but I, the effect it had on me was here for the first time in my career was a place where people who came through the, work, through the door to work there were trusted. That was the default position. You could lose trust, but it was given. And it was quite the reverse of everywhere where I'd worked before where you had to earn it. And what it made me think about was how different a place it felt. It made it feel as if you were not swimming in water anymore, but swimming in air. It was easy to get stuff done. Mm. There was this sort of tacit approval for things. People would talk very openly in an almost sort of European way. There was, there was no kind of politics or issue. People would just discuss stuff. And I put it down to the fact that people who walked through those double doors were trusted if they were um, part of the GDS team. And that's why I still hold with it. I mean, I've got to say, I've not worked anywhere since where it's given as well as that, but it's definitely a culture I'm big on. Um, and it's actually quite hard for people to understand what you mean unless they've kind of felt that. So I think it's beholden on leaders to show the way. Yeah. I guess, I guess my experience has been similar to yours before then, where I've worked in very top-down organisations mm. and distrust is kind of the, the default. Really. Mm. And it's very empowering to be trusted, uh, both as an individual and as part of a team that's trusted. And that's, you know, uh, empowerment's essential for agile ways of working, isn't it? Absolutely is, yeah. I mean, I, I remember having a brief given to me to make GDS operational. I had no idea how you'd even start with that. But a few meetings later, Jamie impressed on me that it was my, my job to sort that out. Mm. And it wasn't done in a, in a, in a sort of you know, good luck with that, mate. It was, it was really, no, you've got this. And I think helping people understand that they've got that makes them step up, makes them learn how to do it. And it was just very exciting. I mean, I've, I've got to say the high pace there and the focus on delivery just worked very nicely with that high trust yeah, yeah, yeah. atmosphere. Uh, and as I said, I think I'm trying very hard in every place I've worked to make sure that that's the culture that we have, because you can just do so much. Was it at GDS you also discovered the idea of user, user centricity? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think its legacy is long. Uh, for the first time after leaving GDS, you'd hear people who were not attached to digital at all using the word user in corridors and speaking about the user. And I think for the first time I saw the importance of putting out stuff that people could actually use. So many things in government were done without that in mind previously. And we, we know how difficult they were for particularly frontline staff and the public to use. And that's actually what the GDS mantra of trust was getting at, was trust in government services. Mm. I didn't kind of clock that until much later. I interpreted it as sort of trust amongst ourselves, yeah, but yeah. both are around making something that 
a team that works very fluidly can put out, be sure that the users who use it will be able to use it. Yeah. And that means a lot of contact with them, which was really interesting. Never seen that before. Yeah. So frontline staff are users, citizens are users. Um, you might have businesses who are users. Mm. But these are all, um, it's important to consider all these types of users when you're developing government services, is that right? Yeah, it is. I mean, definitely is, uh, a focus for us definitely is frontline staff. There just aren't enough. And our job is to make things better for them so they can spend their professional time doing their job, not worrying about the tech they have to use. That said, government historically has struggled to focus on what we would probably call nowadays end users, you know, mm. citizens. And I think the job of digital folk in particular is to be their champion. They're usually an afterthought, and I don't, I don't think deliberately. I just think government has massive priorities and it thinks in terms of how it runs itself. Yeah it very rarely has the time to sit down and think about people outside of itself. Is there a role then for leaders to get involved oh, 100%. in this user-centred work? Yeah, absolutely, I think it is. I think the Chief Digital Information Officer in MOJ is somebody I speak to often about this, and I've, I've said to her, um, you're probably the last champion of the end user, the person out there in prison, the person on probation, the person who uses a court service. That's just because government doesn't have a huge amount of time to think about end users. It should, but it, it doesn't. It prioritises its business. It's got a lot to get done. And it thinks of its staff rightly. But I think unless all of the leaders are pulling behind that, the CDI has a really big function to play and people working in digital particularly so. And I guess our job is to educate people. And recently we had a really good example of a painful thing that went out with enough, without enough user testing. Mm. It was just a re-platform product, which the team thought would behave like the old thing, yeah. and it didn't. And we hadn't done user research. And the operational front line immediately said they had huge difficulty using it. It was just a reminder, really, a lesson we all know. But I think, I think it's crucial that leadership backs the amount of time it takes to do user research properly. Mm -hmm. And it's much better to take longer to put something out that works then rush something out that doesn't because you'll pay later yeah, um, yeah. exponentially more to get, it, to get it fixed. We worked together again in 2016 at uh, Department for Business where you were leading um, the digital apprenticeship service, particularly the digital delivery, is that right? Yeah, that's right. It was, a, it was a brand new government service to marry a new levy on big employers, employers with more than uh, 50 staff members or paying a certain amount toward their HR bill would have a certain amount of tax taken off them and put into a ring-fenced area specifically for apprentices. So we had to build a service that allowed that. Mm -hmm. We had to integrate with Her Majesty, His Majesty's Revenue and Customs uh, tax system. And we had to really broker a three-way relationship between people who wanted to do an apprenticeship, people who wanted to provide it, and people who wanted to assign people to it. Mm. Um, and we had kind of nine months to do it. Uh, so that was, that was my first big digital service uh, after, I left, um, after I left GDS, really. Yeah, yeah. And um, if I remember correctly, you were working quite closely with the policy people on the apprenticeship service as well. Yeah, I think the reason that worked so well is we had that kind of holy trinity working as one. We had operational people represented in the room. We had policy people representing the government's intent and delivery all in the same conversation. Mm. That's so crucial. That really is uh, the important thing to get right when you're doing government service delivery. Without one of those edges of the triangle missing, you have a lot of time and extra pain taken to get the thing right. Yeah. And that was quite a high profile delivery as well. I think the Chancellor of the Exchequer was the main sponsor for that work. Uh, that's right, yeah. Uh, it, it, it was labelled, I think, a, a key government priority of the sort of three or four that year. What's it like uh, being in the hot seat on a delivery like that? Quite fun, actually. I think, I think it really turns on having a high trust environment, uh, which we did and having policy operations and delivery working together, which we did. 
And having um, senior leadership kind of lined up on what needed to be done and speaking regularly with them. I won't say it wasn't bump free, definitely was. The other thing that I think was um, really useful was a militant focus on speed. We had to get the thing done in terms of the timings of the government announcement. And the only thing that can change there is scope. But um, it made us fixate on what you know, minimally viable meant. Yeah. Um, and that high-paced environment is actually quite fun for teams. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really interesting. And, and uh, did you manage to deliver it in the nine months? Yes. Yes. I mean, I think it was minimally viable. Yeah. Uh, there was the, the long tail really comes afterwards when yeah. you're sort of adding further features, but it did what it needed to do. Uh, it, it took a tax off of employers, they could see it. It allowed them to apply for apprenticeships, it allowed people supplying those to put their details into yeah. a system, and it allowed apprentices to apply for apprenticeships and get them. So, um, fast forward to 2019, and you're back at the Ministry of Justice. Yes. Like, why, why go back? I mean, I guess it's my spiritual home. I mean, I think I like justice. Uh, and there was an opening. I had a sabbatical from government very briefly, caught some sun, saw some family in South Africa, and then came back. And I was approached with an option to choose between probation and prisons. And two things made me choose probation. One was uh, the leader at the time, the Director General, Amy Rees, had written about her vision, and it was pretty inspiring. And secondly, I guess I come down more on the side of the fence of being interested in fixing people. Prisons has a really useful part to play in protecting people from themselves and from uh, the public who they might do harm to. Uh, however, I'm much more interested in what made a person do the thing they did. Mm. How can we stop them doing that? Most people wouldn't choose a life of crime, um, given, given equal choice. So, yeah, I chose probation, and I'm uh, head of digital probation now. What's the background to the probation work, and kind of what's your strategy? Well, I mean, I, I came into a thing that was already rolling down the, the tracks uh, called the Probation Reform Programme, and the idea was to try and re-nationalise probation. So, four or so years before, uh, the Ministry of Justice had outsourced risk management, low and medium risk management to private companies. And those private companies weren't doing a good enough job. So I had to transfer all of those people's case files, sensitive information, into our authority systems, about 8,000 of them. And COVID happened a few months after I started. So rather than giving them devices at an office where they'd normally go and pick it up, we had to get laptops and phones shipped out to people's homes. And we had a, we had a year to do that. So that was, that was pretty much everything we lived, breathed, and thought about. It was the renationalization of the probation service. So how does your work in digital kind of connect to the broader strategy in probation? So, yeah, we're now in a place, I think, where we can start thinking about transforming what is probation. Uh, and it's pretty, pretty clunky digital heritage systems, I suppose it's fair to say. Mostly there to mark a person's homework. So, you know, I came in this morning, I did this, this, this and this, rather than here's the information you need to do the art of probation. We built a first digital service called Refer and Monitor and Intervention. Uh, what that was there to do is provide somebody with a package of counselling or training, if you like, geared to their specific needs. So, for instance, an anger management programme or a drug treatment programme. And the idea, a bit like the apprenticeship, was to sort of marry suppliers who had them, people who needed them, and people who wanted to assign them and build a service that, that did that. Mm -hmm. And we had a short time frame to, to build a minimally viable service that did that, and we did. Uh, and now we're iterating that, and we're building a bunch of new other digital services that plug together the data, which is scattered across different systems and not joined up. So there's kind of a legacy system landscape. Yeah, very much so. 
and you're um, providing kind of modern services to replace or augment that, those? Yeah, th th there's a strategy to get off of those at some point. Mine is a bit further away uh, right now. I had a lot of services to uh, get on with as part of the program of work they wanted me to do. I'm now starting to look at how do I decompose those big monolithic services? How do I take the data that's held hostage in them and free it up? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the sort of system we're following is to build microservices loosely coupled um, with APIs that kind of connect up with each other. And what, what sort of team do you have to kind of help you? Mostly digital experts. I think there are some generalists in there who are super useful in terms of helping us with reporting and program governance and what have you, but mostly multidisciplinary digital teams. We've grown from 20-ish 20 in 2019 to just over 100 now. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got, some, we've got some growing structures to sort through. We're still a, an organization hoping to get 50% bigger yet. But yes, small teams with digital experts from software engineering to user research, um, solving um, small business problems, user problems. And are you, are you working with probation policy and operations in the same way you worked with apprenticeship policy and operations? Yes and no. I think there's, I think there's more to be done to meet operational needs. They're a little bit invisible. We do some user research with them, but we're very, we're very aligned with policy colleagues. But we are finding we're putting things out which aren't as usable for frontline staff. And I don't doubt people on probation than I would like. So the next limb of the strategy is to try and crack that try and see how we can get operational folk, not just um, in conversation with us, but as sort of de facto team members. Yeah. And when you, um, when you joined Probation Digital, or when you started leading it, were you kind of welcomed with open arms by the probation leadership? <laughs> I think they were pleased I'd arrived to pick up this thing that they needed doing. But I think it's fair to say our way of working, uh, and we work in an agile way, was at odds with a quite traditional, you write everything down up front that you're gonna get. Yeah. And you hand that to somebody and they go away for a few years and out pops the, out pops the thing. Uh, so we needed a lot of help in terms of providing a buffer between teams so that they could move in the way they normally move. And I think the leadership challenge there was to give them that freedom and that space. And at the same time, uh, keep the sponsors and the stakeholders in the loop and happy enough with what you were doing. Um, I use that expression quite a lot in terms of um, thinking about that kind of in-between bit, buffer or sponge, and I think it was a very big one at the start of the program, yeah, and yeah. It's, it's kind of smaller and flatter now. Just, just going back to trust. Um, yes. Have you, have you earned it, do you think, then, or have you been given it? I think I've earned it. And I think the only way you can get into a mode of giving it is to see others doing it and to work in a space where it's given. And it's working quite well in some areas where we've got, I guess, policy folk bought in and working with the team and seeing how the team works. They start to give the team their trust. They start to be, to be the best advocates for the, the work of the digital team. And it's blurring that line between them and us, that, that whole customer supply, I think that's crucial for yeah. digital leaders to break down. We are the business. Yeah, exactly. There's no point saying they the business and we the digital people. Yeah, I mean, you're, not a, you're not a supplier in that, in that right. sense, are you? We've just, we just got digital skills, but we are the business. What's next then over the next kind of one, two, three years in probation for you? For me, it's really working out whether we're turning the dial in terms of the rates of reoffending. So. I think it's fair to say globally there's a big problem. I was looking at the rates of reoffending across Australia and Canada and America and they're high. The only country that's really cracked it is Norway. About 2019 they decided to focus on getting people out of the cycle of crime. And they spent a lot of time and effort doing that. And they've got rates of reoffending. So that's when people have committed an offence and then commit another. At around the 23% mark. Ours is around the 40 to 50% mark. And sadly, one in two people with a long history of criminal behavior will be back inside prison within two years. And that's, yeah. that's you know, catastrophic for them, for society. So 
I think the thing I'm gonna do is slim my portfolio and focus on fewer things and do them better and really, really get down and dirty with what's gonna turn the dial in terms of reducing recidivism, as they say, mm -hmm. people reoffending. It's, it's great to hear that connection with uh, the kind of organizational goals. You're not, you're not just kind of the IT folk supplying laptops to the organization. You're, you're, um, you're really helping the organization achieve those goals. I mean, that's really interesting. They, there's still some sort of language of IT being used as shorthand for data, digital and technology. That's an awareness of how digital ways of working change what your business can do. And I think it's beholden on us uh, as leaders to kind of show that. A, lo a lot of people simply don't know what, what a good service could be and they don't know what data freed up could do. So that's a really good point and that's another area of focus which is what could the world of probation look like? You know, could we have prisons without walls for instance for people on short sentences where we can effectively monitor them in the community so effectively, you don't need to put them behind bars. Yeah. You know, they can probably keep a job, a partner, um, a family relationship, all those things which once gone, very, very hard to, to get back. Yeah. You mentioned the role of leadership uh, a few times. Have you had any inspirational leaders in the past kind of uh, 10 definitely. to 12 years? Yeah, I th th there was one that I think you introduced me to called David L. Marquette when we were working at the Department for Education. And he was captain of a nuclear submarine and he had a different way of leadership he wanted to try out and he got permission from his superiors to try it out. And his worst performing boat became the best performing in the US Navy and, and people were fascinated. So he wrote a book called Turn This Ship Around or Turn This Boat Around. Um, he proposes a leader-leader model, which I really love, and it's pushing decision-making down to the lowest practical level in the hierarchy in the organisation. Mm. And I think his argument was that the guy that turns the screw on the nuclear missile silo, he knows more about that than anyone else on the boat, so kind of let him make a decision about turn, turning screws uh, on, on silos. And I think... It's a culture I've tried to bed in in my digital teams, which is the, the team is the unit delivery. Unless there's something catastrophically wrong, let that unit of delivery make decisions about yeah. what's best for the user, what's best for the product. So he's definitely one. Uh, Rachel Hope, another great government digital leader, she, she just had a dogged determination and a really good work ethic to get things done. Uh, she didn't have sharp elbows. Yeah. She, she just stuck at it. And I think it was her resilience with a plan that really inspired me. Um, Sophie Otter, my counterpart, she is fixated on getting off a legacy prison system. And single-mindedly, you know, that, that her teams live, eat, breathe and sleep. And yeah. you ask anyone working in prison, what's your mission? And they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll say that. Um, and a, 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 you know, a, whole, a whole bunch of others. I think Kaz Houghton working in the Office of Public Guardian is another. She's the role model for a service owner. She's cracked that policy working with delivery and operations. Um, and she's an exemplar of how you build a good government service against the government service standard. She really is. So looking back over the past, I don't know, t 10 years since you were at GDS, what, what might a few lessons be for other leaders in a digital role? I mean, I think I can only say the ones that impacted on me the most. And I think trust is the first. Almost impossible to describe unless you've seen it happen. But try and give it. Try and work uh, on the basis that people are there to do their best. And if you can put them in a place where they're allowed to, They'll do magnificent things. Um, and the other, I think, is um, great government service delivery comes from being single-minded about usability, making sure you set your team up to do user research, making sure you set leaders up to expect that it's going to take time to do that properly, uh, and gently helping people who feel they might be experts understand that they aren't the user. 
They might be experts and they can offer the team advice, but really it's only when a product is in front of a person using it that you really learn whether you've got it right. So those two, I think, are dear and sacred to me. There's plenty of others I've learned besides. I mean, I think I mentioned as well the, the, the holy trinity of getting to delivery, yeah. policy and operations together. Is the strategy still delivery? In my mind, it is. I mean, I can't think of a better one. You know, what, what are we if we're not producing goods for users, digital, digital goods principally, but not always. Yeah. Um, help it, helping the business realise that, I think, gets you out of those difficult political conversations about what could be and what should be. Yeah. Just, just crack on and do stuff. Um, as said, users will soon tell you whether you've got it right or wrong. All right. Thanks for speaking to us today, Mark. Thank you for having me.